Thanks a lot for that kind invitation to talk uh, today about this amazing project of the forward physics facility. So we will switch gear a little bit uh, and talk about uh, the forward physics facility at the LHC. And in particular, I would like to point out kind of the intersection of the physics program at the LHC in the forward physics facility and astroparticle physics. So. Not on. There you go. Yeah, that's better. All right. So uh, after a very quick introduction, I would like to overview kind of the facility and the timeline uh, of our plans to build that facility at LHC. I will very briefly go over the experiments we are planning to deploy uh, in that facility. And then I would like to focus on the astroparticle physics connection uh, of the, the facility itself. So um, I guess before we do that, we need to step a, or go a step back and, and ask ourselves, why do we need a forward physics facility? I mean, the LHC has been very successful in, for example, finding the Higgs, you're all aware of that, uh, and testing standard model predictions to precisions uh, at the highest accuracy, basically. However, we were all hoping, I think, that you see some evidence for some new physics, some BSM physics, or some signatures that are not understood in the context of the standard model. So the obvious question um, here is, what opportunities are we actually currently missing by the lack of coverage of the far forward region at the LHC? You know that all the experiments, like here the Atlas experiment, they are highly focused on measuring particle production in the traverse direction, so high PT, um, particle production, basically. But we also know that by far the largest flux of, of light particles, such as mesons and neutrinos, all the leptons, but also potential dark matter candidates or BSM physics candidates like uh, dark photons or axon light particles and whatever your favorite model is, um, these particles are produced, or the largest flux of these particles is actually produced in the forward region, which basically Right now, all the experiments at the LHC are blind to. So what the proposal is here is to build a dedicated facility that houses several experiments in the line of sight of ATLAS. So it would look like that. In the line of sight, after several hundred meters of rock, we would like to build a facility that really measures the forward particle production at the LHC, here in particular uh, in the ATLAS detector, at the line of sight of the interaction point. And as you will see, this has large synergies actually um, with astroparticle physics. And just to motivate that, just looking at this very simple picture, you already see similarities, right? So at LHC, you have particle collisions and then particles produced in the forward region. And if you look at this, this picture of an air shower here in the atmosphere, it's in principle sort of the same interaction, right? You don't have two particles colliding, but you basically have a fixed target collision. But what happens here is you produce particle cascades in the forward region that we measure in air shower experiments at the ground. And what we can study uh, at the FPF or in the forward region of these interactions is in principle hydronic physics that are relevant for air shower development. We can measure uh, neutrino production that is relevant for the searches for high, astro um, high energy astrophysical neutrinos but we will also be sensitive to any kind of signatures of these M physics or dark matter candidates. Um, I have to start with a short disclaimer because this is a huge community effort. Actually, I call it a multi-community effort because if you see, uh, as you see, there's a comprehensive physics program at the FPF, um, which consists of the search for new particles, long-lived particles, dark matter, um, dark matter particles and BSM scattering signatures, but also like standard model physics in the forward region like um, QCD or standard neutrino physics. And then you see down here, there's also a large part that is related to astroparticle physics. And this will be relevant for this talk today. So um, in the context of the snow mass uh, efforts, we actually had already two papers and we call that a short paper, which is the first real paper on the LPF. It's not really short because it has 75 pages, 
uh, but on my next slide, you will see why we call it short paper. It had about 80 authors and uh, it's published in physics reports. You can find it on archive. It was the first collection of ideas. What do we want to measure in the forward region of the LHC? And it kind of serves as a first reference for, for future work. And it was the basis for the long white paper, um, which was the white paper submitted to SNOMAS, which is a super comprehensive document of 430 pages, roughly, with uh, more than 230 authors, uh, more than 150 endorsers. We just uh, submitted it to Journal of Physics G, actually, and it got accepted last week. And you'll find the preprint uh, on archive. So if you want to have the entire story of the FBF, enjoy reading uh, this very comprehensive document. Um, here's an overview of, of the table of contents of this document, just to give you an impression what I have to skip today, right? So there's a part about the facility experiments and, and all these uh, physics questions that I raised at the beginning. However, there's also a quite comprehensive part about uh, the connection to astroparticle physics, and this will be the focus of the following. Um, before we get there, however, let me introduce you to the actual plans to build this facility. Um, so right now, there are actually three detectors in operation um, that exploit the forward physics potential during the run three of the LHC. And these are phaser and phaser new that are located here in this UJ12 pattern. And then we have SNZ um, that is located at UJ18. Um, and these experiments are in the line of sight of the Atlas experiment, and they're shielded by a couple of hundred meters of rock, which means there's extremely low background, and it makes those experiments an ideal facility to measure rare processes, such as all kinds of exotic physics scenarios, but also neutrino physics, and again, your favorite dark matter models, for example. Um, so the plan is, with the forward physics facility to extend this forward measurement program of the LHC into the high luminosity era of the LHC. And for the white paper, we actually explored two options for this facility. The first one and the obvious one, because this is where um, right now phaser and phaser new are located, would be to extend the UJ12 cavern to have more space, to have larger target, uh, material in the experiments, increase the fluxes and, and extend the measurements um, of, of phaser and phaser new, for example. And the second option we explored was a purpose-built facility where we basically, we would build a new cavern where it's indicated on this map here that is connected to the LHC and that would house several experiments. Um, in the meantime, since we submitted the paper, we actually got some feedback from CERN and uh, the option number one with the extended cavern is highly disfavored due to uh, kind of organizational uh, questions. For example, we will be able to build um, a purpose-built facility while the LHC is running. That wouldn't be possible uh, to build any experiments in the LHC tunnel while the LHC is running, which would cause quite, quite a few delays. Uh, so actually, the um, recommendation of CERN was to go for the purpose-built facility. So in the following, I will actually only talk about the scenario of a purpose-built facility, although it will also find um, ideas to extend the UJ12 cavern in this white paper. Um, currently, there are five uh, proposed experiments, and I will get back to that in a second. First of all, there's also an update here. So this is the picture uh, of the white paper where you still see there was a requirement of a safety gallery. There was a connection to the LHC tunnel um, due to security measures. However, we also got the recommendation from CERN that they can handle the safety differently. Don't ask me about the details. However, um, the safety gallery is gone. So we won't have any connection to the LHC tunnel, which will enable us to basically build the entire facility while LHC is running. Um, as I said, there are five experiments planned, and you kind of see, see the, the layout here. Um, I will get back to that in a second, but these experiments will be phaser 2, um, advanced SND, phaser mu 2, Formosa, and the flare detector. Um, I will get back to them later. Um, first, a few words about the timeline. So we are here in 2022. 
we are planning to write a CDR and a TDR during uh, run three uh, of the LHC. And then we will have a long shutdown where we are planning to do the civil engineering, which means we actually found an empty space at CERN where we are planning to build this purpose-built facility that you see here with this access building. And down there, we will have the cavern that will house the five experiments. Um, with the run, uh, start of the run of the high luminosity uh, LHC in run four, we will be able to uh, deploy the services and the experiments. This is the benefit of having a purpose-built facility because we can access the tunnel, or we don't need to access the tunnel. We can build the facility independently. Uh, and then after deploying the experiments, we will be able to start taking physics um, data actually in 2031, which gives us still two years of the run four of LHC before there's a next shutdown, but we'll be able to take data later on until 42 hours. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the proposed experiments. And I start with that shameless propaganda slide here. And I start on the right-hand side. If you look at all previous collider experiments, they all have building size. They took decades of data. The costs are in the billions of dollars. And they found zero neutrino candidates, right? <laughs> then there was a phaser new pilot detector that ran a few years ago, I believe. Um, and you see a picture here. It's a 29 kilogram detector. It has suitcase size. The cost was zero dollars because it was all recycled parts. And they actually found in four weeks of data taking six neutrino candidates. And you can see the details in, uh, in this paper here. And this sort of motivated to follow up on, on this pilot detector. That actually motivated to build Phaser New, um, which is running right now uh, in run three of the LHC. And we expect to measure roughly 10,000 neutrino candidates in Phaser New. Which you see here, this is actually phaser, and at the end, uh, you see the emulsion detector. This is phaser new. Um, so we'll be able to measure within run three of the LHC roughly 10,000 candidate neutrino candidates and 10 to the nine muons. However, it's a little bit difficult to do actual science with the muons because the origin is not well understood because they are produced in secondary scattering in the rock of pions and so on. So it's hard to, to actually find the origin of those muons, but this is uh, under investigation right now. So what we are planning for the forward physics facility in phaser <laughs> U2 uh, would be an even larger detector that is housed in, in this facility. And we would expect on the order of 10 to the six neutrinos um, that we can detect within the first two years of data taking shifting. Same works for the muons, but again, it's difficult to actually find the origin of those, of those muons. Um, this is just an overview of the five detectors, and I don't want to make this a detector talk, so I don't want to go into the details here, but in principle, we have five detectors that measure, or that are optimized to measure long-lived particles, neutrinos, um, but all kinds of other uh, BSM physics scenarios as well, such, such as really charged particles, or light dark matter. Um, again, if you want to have a complete description of the detector design, please take a look at the white paper. However, it's still a little bit in flow. So we are still optimizing everything and we're listening to the community, listening to the needs. And if you have a certain need for your, or in order to test your model, please let us know and we might be able to incorporate that in the design of those detectors. All right, now let me talk about the connection to astroparticle physics and the FBF. Um, this is a very quick overview. So first of all, we are measuring extensive air showers. Um, and basically what we are doing here is looking at multi-particle production in hydronic interactions, right? And we know, and I will talk about that in a second, there are discrepancies we observe, the so-called muon puzzle, which indicates severe shortcomings in our understanding of those interactions. And therefore, studying hadronic interactions in the forward region at the FPF will help to better understand the development of air showers in the atmosphere. In addition, I told you we will measure high energy neutrinos at the FPF. And in particular, interesting, we will be able to directly measure prompt neutrino production at the FPF, so decay of charmed mesons, D mesons, or lambdas. Um, and therefore, we will hopefully be able, for the first time, to measure the prompt neutrino production at the FBF, 
uh, which will improve the modeling of, of prompt neutrino fluxes and reduce the uncertainties, which is the relevant background for uh, astrophysical neutrino searches and background for large scale neutrino telescopes. Last but not least, um, there's a huge variety of BSM scenarios that can be tested, um, which also includes tests of dark matter scenarios where you obviously see the connection to astroparticle physics. So let me start with the muon puzzle and hadronic physics in air shower. So this is a compilation of muon measurements from nine experiments where we basically show the muon content in air showers that are measured by the individual experiments in terms of that Z scale defined in the upper right there, where you basically take the log of the measured muon densities and compare that to simulated densities that rely on a model. Um, by construction, if your data agrees with a proton hypothesis, it would line up at zero. If it agrees with a iron hypothesis, uh, it would, uh, would take the value one. So now what you see here is also a grayish band. And this is a band that is expected from composition measurements based on Xmax, which have very small uncertainties. So if these composition measurements would agree with the muon measurements, all the muon data should line up in this grayish band. However, obviously you see this is not the case, especially at the high energies, we see that excess of muons in air showers with respect to simulations um, that indicates compositions that are even heavier than iron. They're definitely not consistent with, with the composition measurements based on Xmax. And this is what we refer to as the muon puzzle in air showers. So why is it so challenging to, to model air showers in the atmosphere? Well, first of all, most of those muons are produced in the far forward region, right? And second of all, we have a very complex hadron composition. So it's not just proton-proton collisions, but you have pions reacting with nitrogen molecules in, in the atmosphere and stuff like that, where first of all, the data is very limited that we have from, from accelerators. There's basically no data in the forward direction and uh, finding data of these heavy hadrons or other particles interacting is very hard. Second of all, all these interactions happen in the non-perturbative regime. So calculations based on first principles are basically not possible. Um, one interesting fact I would like to point out is we actually have some evidence from the Ellis experiment, and there's a strangeness enhancement that actually increases when you get closer to the beam. So in the forward direction, it seems there's something not fully understood. And there's a very nice model here. On the right-hand side, you see the mu numbers measured by Auger in black, by the Pierre Auger collaboration. Um, and then you see different lines here. And these lines correspond to different enhancements of the strangeness in the model. It's a very simple toy model where you basically just swap ions by kaons, and therefore you enhance the strangeness. On the other hand, this also enhances the muon number. And you see for certain uh, choices of the parameters in that toy model, um, I don't want to go into the details, but basically you can increase the muon number by swapping pions and kaons, and you can actually see that you can reach a level where you can explain the data observed by Auger that is not consistent uh, with the current models. Um, so this is an interesting uh, opportunity for the FPF to, to test multi-particle multi production in air showers, because basically what we measure are electron and muon neutrinos at the FPF that can be used as proxies for the pion, underlying pion and kaon distributions. Um, possibly we can also use the muons. I said that before, it's a little bit challenging to actually use the muons for physics because it's not clear what the origin of each of those muons was because you have secondary interactions within the rock and so on. But this is actually under investigation. And we think, for example, we are considering sweeper magnets as well that would give us a separation of the muons and we could produce a muon over density in the detector that also would give us a handle on the muons. But this is still under investigation at the moment. Um, in general, this provides very, very helpful tests of, of air shower models. So what you see here are basically um, air shower or models that we use for in order to describe hadronic interactions in, in the air shower development. And these are simulations for the FPF. So these would be spectra that we observe at the FPF. 
and that would help us to test those model predictions. Um, moreover, this is a complementary measurement to, to the ice cube measurements of high energy neutrinos, for example, or also the high energy muons. So we could directly compare the results at the FPF to ice cubes measurements. Um, here is another example. These are the simulated expected neutrino fluxes in phase one two. And you nicely see that we are actually able, based on their spectral shape on the left hand side for electron neutrinos, right hand side for muon neutrinos, we will be able to differentiate between or the spectral shapes of uh, pi on decays to k on decays. And you also see at the highest energies nicely uh, this axis due to uh, charm decays, so prompt, prompt uh, left hand production basically. And there you see large differences in the, in the model predictions actually. And we'll be able to pin that down and see how large is actually the, the prompt production due to charm decays at the FPF. Similarly, uh, we can do these measurements in, in flare. And here you see an example how the strangeness enhancement model would show up um, at the FPF. So each of these different lines are different strangeness enhancements, and we would be able to constrain those models at the FPF. Um, next of all, of course, if you understand the air shower better, you understand neutrino production better, right? And we will directly measure neutrino production at the FPF. Here you see a plot from IceCube, where actually this line corresponds to the 90% confidence upper level for charm production, so for prompt neutrinos. Um, and at the FPF, for the first time, we will be able to directly measure uh, prompt neutrino production and actually constrain those models and confirm, hopefully, uh, the limits from IceCube and reduce the uncertainty in, in model predictions. because. We have very high statistics in Trino data in the forward region. And one of, we will measure, for example, also the parton distribution functions, which is one of the driving factors for the large uncertainties in the modeling of prompt neutrino fluxes. Um, by understanding these production mechanisms at the FPF, we will be able to improve the models for prompt atmospheric neutrino production. And that in turn will reduce the uncertainties in astrophysical neutrino searches, where the prompt background, as you see here, is actually the, expected to be the dominating background. Um, finally, just a few words on dark matter searches or ESM physics as the FPF, because there is a huge variety of models that can be tested. And I think there are probably 200 pages in the white paper. Uh, on BSM scenarios that can be tested. So I won't be able to go into all of those in my last two and a half minutes, um, but I want to give you an overview. So there are, there are several models. You can test long-lived vector particles such as dark photons, exotic gauge bosons. You can test long-lived scalars, dark Higgs, two Higgs doublets, and so on. Long-lived fermions like stellar neutrinos or heavy nuclear leptons can be tested, um, but also, all kinds of other long-lived particles who basically traverse the rock and interact in the detector, such like, like axion-like particles or inelastic dark matter. And there's even more. We can see dark matter scattering, milli-charged particles, and so on and so on. You can pick your favorite model, and we could probably test it at the uh, FPF. Uh, I just want to give you a very short overview now of three models that I pretty much randomly picked. Um, and you pick your own model yourself, OK? Um, so one example that um, we considered in, in this FPF white paper uh, is dark matter from freeze and semi-production, where you basically have a mediator field um, and your dark matter interacts with that mediator field. Um, and we can basically set limits in this uh, parameter scale here that you see on the right hand side, where you see the lifetime as a function of the mediator mass. Uh, and you see the phaser two limits uh, for the for the FPF basically, where we could exclude large regions of the parameter space. Uh, similar for freeze and stellar neutrino dark matter, where you introduce uh, basically three Majorana fermions um, that also add a, an extra Z boson, uh, and we can basically place very strong constraints with phaser two in this coupling versus uh, Z mass plane. Um, and finally, there's another model of imprints of scale uh, invariance and freeze in dark matter, um, where you see that we can test regions of the phase space that are 
partly exacerbated by any other experiment and actually can also exclude large, large um, areas in that phase space. Um, there are, as I said at the beginning, there are many, many more BSM scenarios. And if you're interested, take a closer look. If you don't find your favorite model, please let us know. And we are very happy to consider those models as well. Um, and that brings me to the end. So in principle, the forward production of hadrons is crucial to understand airship uh, measurements in general, because uh, we need to understand the multiparticle production. We know there's a muon puzzle, so there are some, some shortcomings in our understanding of these air showers. And in addition, if you understand air showers better, you understand the relevant backgrounds for neutrino telescopes better for existing ones and also in the future for Gen 2 and other uh, planned neutrino telescopes. Um, it will generally help to understand lepton production and thereby reduce associated uncertainties for astrophysical measurements. And that will improve, for example, the measurements of mass composition by reducing the uncertainties in the muon measurements, but also improve the uh, uncertainties or the accuracy of astrophysical neutrino searches because we'll have a better understanding of, of the relevant backgrounds. Again, for further reading, I refer you to the, to the papers uh, we published. Um, I would like to thank everyone who contributed or is still contributing to that project. Um, unfortunately, I have to leave right after my talk because I need to catch my bus. Apologies to the next speaker in advance. Um, so if you have any questions beyond this conference, unfortunately, you won't catch me outside, but please don't hesitate to shoot us an email. If you have any input, any ideas that we should consider for the FPF, we are very happy uh, to consider all kinds of scenarios. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, well, if there are no questions from the audience, oh, okay, there are no questions. Yeah, maybe I, you went through neutrinos, a lot of information on neutrinos. Uh, which, do you be able to say anything about neutrino? Yeah, we will actually be able, uh, that's one of the main objectives. We want to measure the high energy neutrino protections as well. And for example, we'll be able to close the gap between existing collider measurements at the moment and ice cube. So this is exactly the region where we will be sensitive and basically fill up the gap in the neutrino measurements as well. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, well, I think you have a question. So if you're looking for like light dark sectors. Um, I'm wondering if there's like some sort of maybe I missed it, some sort of like threshold effect or where it sets a lower limit on how light we can go. Or what's is there is there such a limit? I had to look up the individual models. Uh, I could imagine that, but I cannot recall, I cannot quote any model. So I had to look it up myself. Fair enough. Yep. a little bit on why this um, little safety corridor became a necessary I actually I was also a little bit surprised and I just uh, I was told yesterday basically that this uh, safety corridor is not there anymore uh, I honestly don't know um, also I didn't really see a problem because you will find in the white paper for example we calculated the radiation in the cavern that we are planning to build with the the connection to the LHC tunnel, and we actually came to the conclusion that it's still accessible. We would have a thick door there, basically, and the radiation was at a very low level. Uh, but in the end, CERN decided it's not needed anymore for safety reasons, for reasons I don't really know. And we are happy uh, to do it without. That's all. If not, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I would love to. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, go for it. Thank you.
That was tense. <laughs> All right, so we're going to have to go and 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 we're going to have to go it's really great to be back in Kingston and to be giving a talk basically in the wild uh, where no one here works on what I work on, except for Caitlin, who wrote a paper on Pulsar Time once, which was delightful. Um, so if you have any questions, I hope that you can feel comfortable asking me anything because I'm just going to assume that no one knows anything about Pulsar Timing Arrays except for maybe Christine. <laughs> who knows about the SKA? And this might also turn into an SKA fan club uh, session. Uh, so I'm going to start with an overview of the gravitational wave spectrum and then tell you how pulsar timing arrays work. Importantly, I'm going to walk you through the new nanograv 12 and a half year data set and the detection of this common red noise process that we're trying very hard to not call a signal. So we call it the common red noise process. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about the future of pulsar timing arrays and why we think that this signal is so interesting. Um, so we'll start here with the gravitational wave spectrum going from tens of hertz down to the nanohertz frequency regime. So LIGO can detect stellar mass, black hole mergers, and gravitational waves from those. Uh, LISA, which will launch in 2034, more or less. No one really knows what the future is for that. It could be earlier, it could be later. Um, but with LISA, you can detect um, the baby supermassive black hole mergers, so 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 solar masses. And with pulsar timing arrays, you get um, the very serious supermassive black holes. So 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 solar masses. These supermassive black holes are found in the most massive galaxies, and they merge after galaxies merge. Um, it takes so long for these supermassive black hole binaries to merge that they create a stochastic background. And so if you want to get a, a sense of how long it takes for these black holes to merge, um, in the LIGO band, you're going to spend a fraction of a second uh, where you see a kind of flash of a gravitational wave burst and then you're done. An equal mass, 10 to the 9, supermassive black hole binary, when it enters the pulsar timing array band. How long is this lag? Infinite. <laughs> okay. The distance is too It's too far. Uh, when you enter the pulsar timing array band, um, is something like 25 mega years. So our signals are not transient in pulsar timing arrays. They last basically forever. I think it's enough. I can hear a lot of echoing from here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so the other thing that I want to uh, stress is that you can't see pulsar timing array mergers in the LISA or in the LIGO bands. So even though the gravitational wave strain created by these sources is larger by six orders of magnitude than that which you would detect in LIGO, these supermassive black holes um, merge at around 10 to the minus six hertz. So for the experts in the room, the ISCO frequency of these black holes um, is around 10 to the minus six hertz. And so they merge here. So they're not gonna go into the LISA detector and they're certainly not gonna go into the LIGO detectors. And the next thing, just to try to, you know, retune your intuition. LIGO loves to talk about uh, strain in terms of change in distance over distance and that they found gravitational waves um, that gave the strain a change in distance over distance of something like the fraction of the size of a proton over several kilometers. So for pulsar timing, this would be 10 meters in a light year, which is kind of more for astronomers. Um, but because we're timing pulsars, I like to think of it in terms of the change in time over time. And that's about 100 nanoseconds over a decade. So that is hard. And we need very long data sets to make this detection. Not only that, but we have one data set. We don't you know, turn it off and turn it on again and start all over again. Um, the 15-year data, which I'll talk about towards the end, is really like 15 years of going back 
and, you know, training your steel on the sky, pointing it at something for 30 minutes, and then doing it all over again for 15 years. So this is a huge experiment, which takes a lot of time. So I'll start us off with a little animation um, and tell you how pulsar timing arrays work. So galaxies have supermassive black holes in the center. When galaxies merge, their supermassive black holes merge. And when these supermassive black holes start emitting gravitational waves, they're separated by milliparsecs. Um, so they have overcome the final parsec problem, if you care about that, and are emitting gravitational waves. So the gravitational waves here is this kind of 80s space-time fabric, which is now coming right at us, out of the screen, into the Milky Way galaxy, where, uh, well, Christine is not, timing millisecond pulsars, but people at the SKA will be. Um, and they will be looking at these very regular um, advances and delays in the pulsar arrival time. Um, given that Christine was talking about uh, Meerkat, I wanted to share an anecdote that one of my colleagues, Matthew Bales, has recently timed a pulsar down to 10 nanoseconds um, with Meerkat. And so that is an order of magnitude better than what we need for gravitational wave detection. So we are very much um, at the cusp of, of making, of being able to make this detection um, just with the technology. But importantly, the gravitational waves change the proper distance between two objects. And so the pulsar and the Earth are shifted further away from each other and then closer together, and then further away from each other and closer together. When they're closer together, the pulsar pulses arrive early, and when they're further away, they arrive late. And because we can time them to such high precision, we know exactly when those pulsars, pulses should be arriving. We measure when they do arrive, and the change between the two, or the residual, can tell you if there's a gravitational wave transiting our galaxy. So um, because Dennis isn't here and uh, he can't respond, I can also show my shameless promotion of all of the detectors that we're using uh, in the pulsar timing array experiment, which of course includes uh, Meerkat, which is an SK Pathfinder mission. Here in North America, um, forgive me again, I'm based at an American Institute right now. So the American flag is the first one to appear. Um, I'm from Ottawa. <laughs> um, we used to have Arecibo, which is now, unfortunately, uh, has collapsed. My postdoc, Deborah Good, was actually the last one to use Arecibo, but it collapsed before she got her postdoc offer. So as a theorist, I'm not responsible in any way, shape, or form for this instrument being destroyed. Um, we will uh, soon be using the VLA for more regular pulsar timing array observations. Uh, this is the very large array. The Green Bang Telescope is also one of our key instruments in Nanograv, which is the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. That's our pulsar timing array here. And we also use Chime. Uh, and Chime is really good for the lower frequency uh, pulsar measurements and, uh, and is now even more important than it was before because we used to do a lot of the pulsar timing with Arecibo and Green Bank. And now that Arecibo isn't there, Green Bank has to do a lot of the precision timing, which happens at higher frequencies. Um, and that's only possible because we can offload the lower frequency measurements to Chime. So Chime is now a really critical instrument in the North American efforts to detect these low frequency gravitational waves. Uh, our latest international partner to join the International Pulsar Timing Array, which is, um, the sum of all of these telescopes is GMRT in India. Uh, they are now an official full member of the International Pulsar Timing Array. And the Chinese who have FAST, um, which is basically a lot like Arecibo, but it has like these cool deformable mirrors. So like you can optimize your telescope to look at different parts of the sky and optimize it for the things that we're looking for. Um, FAST is in China and can see almost everything that Arecibo could see, but now you have a lot of political problems uh, if you want to use FAST. So just a little survey of all of our telescopes. Now I was telling you about the pulsar timing residuals, right? Um, many of you have probably never seen a pulsar residual. I certainly had them before I started working on this experiment. Um, so I thought I would show you what they look like. Because the laser pointer um, doesn't work very well, because uh, the screen is bright, I made sure that I can use my uh, pointer here. So this is a pulsar residual. This is pulsar J1713 plus 0747. If you've never seen a pulsar before, 
Um, this first part is the right ascension and the second part is the declination. So any pulsar's name, you already know where it is on the sky. And what you can see here, the expected minus the actual arrival times. Now this is a good pulsar because the residuals are white. So there's no kind of structure in uh, those residuals. And that's really important because the signal that we're looking for, the gravitational wave background in this instance, is a red noise signal. So you would see a kind of ramp or a low frequency noise that's building up over time in the residuals. If your pulsar has that intrinsically because you've done a poor job modeling spin noise and all sorts of exotic physics that's happening at the pulsar, then you can't really use it for this experiment because it's almost completely degenerate with the signal that you're looking for. So this kind of pulsar is great for your experiment because intrinsically it looks um, like it's doing a pretty good job in being very um, noise-free. I, I hesitate to say white <laughs> too much. Um, so anyhow, you can tell here in 2012, we had a telescope upgrade uh, and all of the residuals became even smaller. There's a few outliers, but all in all, 1713 uh, is an excellent pulsar for our experiment. Now there's currently around 2,300 known pulsars of which 10% are millisecond pulsars, um, but there's no paucity of galactic pulsars. So with our new telescopes, there can be up to 30,000 more that are detectable. I'll go into how many of those are actually useful for us um, a little bit later. But now you have residuals. You know that there's lots of pulsars. Well, what can you do with the residuals, right? You cross-correlate them. And that's because the noise in the pulsar should all be independent, that the gravitational wave background signal is in every single one of the pulsars. So the more pulsars that you cross-correlate, the more you can beat down the noise and get more signal. So if I cross-correlate the residuals from pulsar A and pulsar B, there are two fundamental physical objects that pop out. Number one is the characteristic strain, which is the amplitude, basically, of the gravitational wave background. And this depends on the astrophysics of your supermassive black hole mergers. But really, the astrophysics of your source or the fundamental physics of um, something like an inflationary background, there's a lot of other things that can create uh, a characteristic strain. The second part is this angular correlation function, the gamma AB, and for an isotropic and Einsteinian gravitational wave background, this is called the overlap reduction function or the Hellings and Downs curve. And so we're gonna look at that. That gives you what the theoretical spatial correlations are in the pulsars in addition to what the amplitude of this right noise should be um, from the gravitational wave background. So I'm gonna start off telling you about the first part of the signal, which is the characteristic strain. So with LIGO, um, and you know, LIGO is wonderful. Um, I'm all about LIGO. Uh, but LIGO can see the very final part of the uh, black hole mergers. And so that's the chirp. It's kind of a big part over here. If you're lucky, you might see a little bit of in-spiral if you have a, black, a, a binary neutron temperature. Um, with supermassive black holes, you're seeing all in-spiral. The whole signal is going to be in-spiral. You're not going to see the chirp because the merger happens outside of the band. And you're not only seeing one of these, but you're seeing potentially 10,000 of these at the same time because the mergers are so slow. The signal builds up and you get this random uh, or stochastic gravitational wave background. And just in case you haven't seen this recently, it really is quite pretty. Okay, and so the point of this slide here is to show you that when you're computing, uh, this characteristic strain, what you're doing is that you're taking the sum of all of the strains at a given frequency, and you're integrating over the black hole masses and over the redshift. Um, and out you get this characteristic strain function. What's baked in to your characteristic strain function, if you're assuming that your gravitational waves come from supermassive black hole binaries, are things like the galaxy merger rates and what the masses are of your supermassive black hole binaries. And so um, when you look at empirical relations between supermassive black holes and their host galaxies, there's these different you know, competing models. Some predict more massive black holes, some predict less massive black holes. The characteristic strain or this amplitude of the gravitational wave background very strongly depends on that mass. And so the more massive your black holes are, the larger the amplitude of your gravitational wave background is gonna be. So when you actually measure A, this amplitude of the background, what you're doing really is getting a handle 
on galaxy merger rates and black hole masses over their cosmic merger history. So um, the quantity that we always refer to with pulsar timing is this characteristic strain that has an amplitude. And because we have a power law, because astronomers love power laws, um, we reported at a reference frequency of one over a year. And it scales like f to the minus two thirds, and that's for circular binaries. Now, given that um, this is the 10th meeting, I also thought I would include an omega GW term that might make you feel more comfortable. Um, and that's proportional to the characteristic strain squared. And I also just want to remind you how all of those things are related to this measured quantity, which is SAB, the cross power spectral density. So you cross correlate your residuals, out pops these two terms. We just saw the characteristic strain that tells you about black hole masses and galaxy mergers. Um, that's related to this, which is up here. And then the second part is this correlation function. So this is like a two point correlation function. Um, this tells you what the spatial correlation is between any two pulsars on the sky. So for example, if you had pulsars that are separated by 30 degrees on the sky, you expect there to be uh, a correlation of about 0.25 between those two pulsars. If your pulsars are separated by 180 degrees on the sky, it's almost the same. Um, if they're separated by 40 degrees on the sky, it's just above zero, and this can even be negative. Um, but an, a negative correlation or an anti-correlation just means if a gravitational wave background is, per is perturbing your pulsars in a positive way, it's like this. And if it's in a negative way, it's like this. That's all that means. It's not very cute, but some people, it's, it's a scary thing. And the limit of having an infinite number of pulsars out pops this Hellings and Downs curve. So the more pulsars that you have, the more pulsar pairs that you have, the more you can populate this curve. And when you're doing your cross correlations, your SAB, you're gonna have some sort of amplitude squared of the gravitational wave background. Most of our models tell us this is about 10 to the minus 15. So you're gonna have an amplitude on the y-axis of something like 10 to the minus 30. And then you're gonna have this shape that pops out. Um, which is the Hellings and Downs curve. That's how we'll be able to tell if we've detected at least an isotropic gravitational wave background. So what have we seen so far? Uh, it's terrifying for Aaron. Um, so what we've seen so far in the nanograph 12 and a half year data uh, is a deviation from just noise. So up here, um, those of you who are familiar with violin plots, you can really tell that there's not a heck of a lot happening here. It's just noise. Um, this dashed line here is um, the result of transforming all of the pulsar arrival times to the solar system very center, or where you can balance the solar system on the tip of your finger. And we do that because the pulsars are arriving at different, the time of arrivals arrive at different points in the Earth's orbit and at different telescopes at the Earth. So we transform them all to the solar system very center so that they're all in the same place. So anything that you detect with a period of exactly one year is the Earth. So we say that we have no sensitivity at all at that gravitational wave frequency. So what's happened here is that you can tell, you know, this is all white noise, white noise, white noise, and then your violin plot takes off, right? There's some sort of low frequency red noise in all 45 of our millisecond pulsars that's manifesting. And you can model this in a few different ways. So what I'm showing here is a broken power law, that's the blue line, um, which prefers to turn over right here. And so there's something that looks a lot like a gravitational wave background signal that we would expect in terms of the amplitude, this common red noise process that I, um, under oath that I have to say, it's not a signal per se, it's a common red noise process. Uh, and then it, flattens out here, which means that this is all white noise. If you only look at the lowest five frequency bins, then you get this power law model. Again, it looks exactly like the broken power law model, but you can also say that we have no business at all saying that we're allowed to have a broken power law. You can insist that you have just one power law that goes through all of the frequency bins and you get this green one. So on the x-axis, you have the frequency and on the y-axis, you have the residuals. Um, but what we're really plotting is the amplitude spectral density, which is the square root of the power spectral density. Um, and that's that SAB divided by T, which is the observing time. 
there's no cross correlations here. So you don't expect this to have the wavy Hellings and Downs shape. If you don't fix um, the, fre the frequency evolution to go like F to the minus two thirds, which is what you would expect for supermassive black hole binaries, um, then you can actually just try and look and see what values um, of that power law are consistent with what we're seeing. Supermassive black hole binaries aren't doing bad, um, but it's not like right through the middle. And this raises a lot of questions. I mean, for me personally, it makes me wonder, like, obviously, I think it's obvious that there's been a lot of evidence that supports supermassive black holes really do merge, and therefore there should be a stochastic background. But is there also something else? I don't know. We don't know that yet. We don't know that at all. Um, that's the first part. So the data showed us what the amplitude should be. Now I'm adding in the cross-correlation part, the Hellings and Downs curve. So now you see that you have something that's of the order of 10 to the minus 30, um, but this is now from the data. This is the amplitude squared times your correlation function. So the Hellings and Downs curve is this blue line here. Um, and what we've actually measured are these points. And with the Nanogram 11 year data, it's not super convincing that what you're seeing um, is a thing you can kind of draw a straight line through it and still be convinced that a straight line is a good fit. So you can pick a point and now a flash to the 12 year data, the 12 and a half year data, 11 year data, 12 and a half year data. So you can also sort of convince yourself that that's looking more like the Hellings and Downs curve, but the Bayesians will demand evidence. And so that's what I'll give you. Uh, and so if you look at what the evidence is for, um, some common amplitude process, so some common signal that's in all the pulsars versus just an intrinsic pulsar noise. The evidence for that is about 10 to the 4.5 uh, to one. So it's clear that there is a very strong common signal in all the pulsars. But do, do our models prefer the Hellings and Downs curve and this common process to spin noise? Well, to figure that out, you can take your 4.5 and add 0 0.64 to it. And the Bayesians will love this choose your own adventure where you have all of your different models and using this Bayesogram, you can sum up all of the different evidences uh, and figure out what um, the likelihood is of your, of your model. So um, I'm not gonna talk about BayesFM right now. Um, there are subtleties um, which pulsar timers will appreciate and the solar system ephemeris model that you use because you have to transform all of your arrival times to the very center. And I can talk about that later. Um, but Caitlin is ruling me with an iron fist. So I will, I will proceed. Um, we know right now that we are here. We definitely know that there is a common red noise process. We do not know for sure what it is because the evidence for the Helens and Downs curve is very low. It's 10 to the 6.4, um, which is about three to one right, for having a Hellings and Downs um, and common process to just a common process, but it's still much larger um, than just intrinsic noise. So what's next? Well, before Arecibo collapsed, we managed to collect two and a half more years of data. That's the thing with the telescopes, that it takes a long time to collect the data, but then you have to process that data too. And so we actually have a 15 year data set now, um, and that's currently being analyzed very carefully. Um, so there are 68 millisecond pulsars in that data set, um, and you can compare that to the 42 pulsars that there uh, 45 pulsars, sorry, that there were in the 12 and a half year data. The baseline's extend to 15 years, and what we're going to do is to look and see if the signal to noise ratio of that common process is increasing, or also phase factors. Is the Hellings and Down significance increasing? Um, we're also trying to recreate, um, well, not recreate, but create different kinds of timing pipelines to have independent ways of analyzing the data because extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. With the 15-year data set, um, we should also be able to make a concrete detection of the gravitational wave background, which can tell us about different astrophysical models. So even this upper limit model up here, which is the Ostriker Pretorius, uh, sorry, McWilliams Ostriker Pretorius model, um, is still too strong or too optimistic to um, account for what we've seen 
and the nanograph 12 and a half year data. Um, but also what's fun is that people kind of really tried hard to, crop, to come up with models where there was no gravitational wave background because we kept you know, plowing through upper limits and going lower and lower and lower in terms of the amplitudes of people started to say a supermassive black holes aren't really emerging, maybe some fraction stalls. Um, but in fact, we've all of these models have stalling and none of those can possibly be true. So if what we're seeing really is a gravitational wave background from supermassive black holes, not only do they merge, but they love merging. They merge all the time. Uh, so we can learn astrophysics from the characteristic strain. Um, now, once we've detected the gravitational wave background, the next candidate signal that we'll go for are individual supermassive black hole binaries. And so here, um, what I did is that I simulated how our pulsar timing array sensitivity will increase as we add pulsars from SKA. And so we start with the nanograph 11 year data, and then um, say well, what happens when I add all the pulsars from my international partners and wait a few years. Now what happens when we get SKA phase one and then full SKA over here? And so it looks like there's still some asymmetry in terms of our sensitivity in parts of the sky, but look at the uh, strain axis here. This is the strain at 20 nanohertz. So you can see at the top that this varies by an order of magnitude, but when the SKA comes on, this factor, this varies by less than a factor of two on the sky, and with full SKA, it's negligible. So you basically have sensitivity over the entire sky to individual supermassive black hole binaries. And we predict that we should be detecting about 10 by the end of the decade. And those individual supermassive black holes may generate anisotropy in the gravitational wave background. And so the Hellings and Downs curve, as I explained earlier, assumes that the background is isotropic, but what if it isn't? Because it's composed of all of these individual supermassive black hole mergers, right? And so you're bound to have more mergers on one side of the sky than of the other. And so um, what you need to do is to recreate the Hellings and Downs curve or these correlation functions, but now assuming um, some sort of angular power on the sky. And that gives you these new functions. Also, um, Windsor, who I think is uh, here, led a paper um, when she was in Mark Kamienkowski's group at Johns Hopkins, and they looked at what happens um, when you have different polarizations from extensions to GR. So what if plus and cross polarizations aren't the whole story? What if you have a breathing mode like this? Um, you again, get very different correlation functions. And so this can make um, tests of GR possible or extensions in this case of GR um, possible with pulsar timing arrays. Dark matter models, there are so many of them. This morning, just for fun, when I had this slide and I looked on NASA ADS, I know that you guys probably use Inspire, but um, I was on ADS, just looked up dark matter pulsar timing and there were 270 articles. So a lot of them are recent. People are very interested in this nanograph result, but I just want to tip my hat to people who are doing it before it was cool, <laughs> right? Um, work has been going on since the early 2000s. So with fuzzy dark matter, um, what we can do is look at the pulsars and try to see if um, they have like these oscill if they're oscillating with the galactic potential that could be induced by things like fuzzy dark matter. The current upper limits on that for densities below six GeV um, per centimeter cubed is the boson mass of about ten to the minus twenty three eV, uh, and that's from the Pareko et al. paper. That's not really going to change if what we've detected right now, if the stochastic background is what it is, we're actually gonna to have to remove the stochastic background so that we can continue looking for updates to the boson mass measurements this way. Um, but it's still a fun way that you can actually just use our detector for things other than gravitational wave measurements. And then I wanna say that anything that affects the supermassive black hole binary phase can also be measured with pulsar timing arrays. Um, that is through a measurement of something called the pulsar term. So when the gravitational waves transit the galaxy, they perturb the pulsars, and they perturb the signals of the Earth. And so the pulsar perturbations then arrive something like a thousand years later. And so you're getting all of these signals from the past that are arriving. And if you can detect them, then what you can do is try to reconstruct your gravitational waveform using all of these different pulsar terms together with your Earth term. And this can tell you things about the spin evolution of your system, which might be cool for people who like super radiance. 
and uh, different kinds of axion theories. Anything that affects the gravitational wave phase can be measured through this pulsar term experiment. So my last slide is that telescopes are really, really important. Um, we have so many telescopes right now, and that's really important, especially um, now that Arecibo has collapsed. It's really important to emphasize the fact that there's no single point of failure for these pulsar timing ray experiments. If your country's telescope collapses, it just may, means that your, your country is no longer competitive, but the rest of the world will move on. So international, <laughs> international collaboration is super important. In the U.S. right now, they're very focused on DSA 2000 and NGVLA, um, but SKA is really going to be a game changer for all of us. So to summarize, pulsar timing arrays are really interdisciplinary. It's interesting for radio astronomers. It's different. It's, it's interesting if you study dark matter. It's different. It's, it's interesting if you want to know about supermassive black hole mergers. Um, we estimate that with about two more years of data, which we already have, um, with the telescopes that we'll be able to make a confident detection of the gravitational wave background. And so what's next with pulsar timing arrays is really everything. Everything is next. This is like the pre-CMB detection. We haven't even detected the CMB yet. And so I think that this is gonna be a really exciting decade. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Kiara. Also, in here, I'm wondering about what's going on over here. There was an enormous spider that um, Karen very greatly uh, struck and, and took out to my side. We're going to say cockroach. It was an enormous spider. It hadn't paid the registration fee. <laughs> we had to realize he's, he's now relocated to a very nice garden. Yes. We have one combined. I, I actually had a quick question. Oh, oh was there a question? Oh, sorry. Well, we didn't see anything. It's, it's like a nothing question. That's fine. I encourage nothing questions. The, the back end upgrades. Yeah, that was really important. But it seems like most of the residuals that are kind of off that line have biased to uh, what the positive values. Just wondering if that's real. Am I crazy? <laughs> um, both. <laughs> so, um, what what is difficult to show here are that some of the points are at different observing frequencies, um, and so we have uh, dispersion measure measure models that are baked in when you um, are trying to take those residuals, and that's because your gravitational wave, uh, radio waves, radio waves that are traveling at higher frequencies don't see as much of the interstellar medium as the ones that travel at the lower frequencies do. And so you have to de-disperse your signal in that way. And so your dispersion measure models can add a certain kind of systematic, um, that's actually a really important part of modeling um, these signals. So um, yeah, I think that you can see some of the green dots that are kind of more above the stochastic kind of spread, um, but you know, I think I'm not sure that that's real. I think that that just might be here, but as you go on to later years, I don't think that you're going to see that repeating. Other quick questions? I may abuse my power as convener and go a little over time. Um, I'm curious if there's a way to just uh, differentiate between like a more vanilla astrophysics uh, gravitational wave background in these data from like supermassive black hole binaries versus something more exotic for public studies. Absolutely. So let me go um, here. <clears throat> so a, a primordial gravitational wave background um, will have a um, frequency dependence that should go something like um, gamma to the minus five. And that means that here it's five. And so that actually would be um, pretty freaking cool. Like that looks pretty good for a primordial background. And for cosmic strings, it's seven eighths. For supermassive black holes, it's minus two thirds. So everything right now is about minus one. Uh, so it's gonna take about five more years of data to be able to say like, does the model prefer one to the other? Um, right now, everything looks like it's about 
minus one. So it's not clear if it's one or two or like all three that are manifesting in the data, or if it could be, you know, one that's really dominating and the other two just aren't present. But if you had the presence of uh, a primordial background, then it could be from some kind of like ekparotic cosmology, right? You'd have to have a very blue tensor spectrum to create something like that at this kind of amplitude. And then why don't you see it in LIGO? Uh, and so it would have to turn over. And so now you'd have to like throw all of the tricks uh, to get that to be consistent with the data, but it's possible. I mean, who am I to say? Very cool. Well, let's make our speaker one more time. Fantastic. We have a few closing remarks that we'll take.